We can't gather in person on this Good Friday because we're all in isolation from the virus. It's a scary time. I think it helps to think that Christianity was born on another scary day, the first Good Friday. The sun literally went dark. But as Bishop Fulton Sheen wrote, unless there's a Good Friday in our lives, there will never be an Easter. During Lent, we've been watching a series of videos called The Walk, Five Essential Practices of the Christian Life. We're encouraged to pray five times every day, when we wake up, before we eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, and before we go to bed. Read five verses of scripture every day, do five acts of kindness every week, and invite five people to church this year. In this final episode, Adam Hamilton discusses five things Jesus did from the cross on that first Good Friday. We thank Adam Hamilton for granting permission to use these videos and hope to see everyone in person very soon. So we come to the end of our study. We've been together for six weeks and it's been a great joy and privilege to be with you. And I thank you so much for being the audience here and for those of you who are joining us and using this in your churches or in your homes, uh, wherever you may be. Our aim in this study and my aim in writing this book was to help us have a closer walk with God and to talk about the spiritual practice, the essential spiritual practice that will help us to be able to do that. And as we've thought about those, there are thousands, literally thousands of things that we can do. Just like in exercising our bodies, there's thousands of exercises you can do, but there are some that are just essential. You've just gotta be able to do these things. And the five essential practices are five broad categories in which we can live out our spiritual lives, in which we exercise and practice to grow closer to and walk with Jesus. Now, I would say I've given you goals. We've talked about what it means to do this together and what it means to do this alone. And I just remind you that, that these are simply goals. They're, they're a starting point, a way to get started. There's so much more that we can be doing, but at least these things as we seek to walk with Jesus. Many folks are doing this study as a Lenten study. So folks will do it at different times of the year, but many of them are doing it during Lent. And that means that we're in the sixth week of Lent and we're approaching uh, Palm Sunday, which is also Passion Sunday or Holy Week, and we're approaching Good Friday. And so during this week, of course, we're remembering the suffering and death of Jesus. And so as I was thinking about how to conclude this book, I was thinking, let's look to see how Jesus lived out these five practices in his own life. And I thought, what better day to turn to than on the day that he was crucified? And so we're going to explore together the last words of Jesus from the cross. And as we do that, we're going to see how all five of these practices were things that shaped Jesus' life and things that he drew upon or that he was fulfilling or living into as he was there on the cross. And so I want to remind you that it was about nine in the morning that Jesus was crucified. When he was crucified, um, there's no clear consensus on exactly what causes death and crucifixion, but the, the largest att attributing factor, it seems, is asphyxiation. So the lungs fill with fluid around the lungs and, the, and the, the sac around the heart is filled with fluid and it becomes harder and harder to breathe over a long period of time. So victims of crucifixion early in their crucifixion might speak more, but the longer the day progressed, the less they would speak because it was harder and harder to speak. Jesus, the Gospels record seven statements that Jesus makes from the cross. And in order to speak those words, they must have been very important for Jesus because they came at a cost as he was being crucified. So when we look at the and study the seven last words of Jesus, we recognize there was, uh, they were painfully spoken and they must have meant something important to him and to the gospel writers who recorded them. But we're going to look at these statements just to see what they might tell us and how we might see in them Jesus practicing the five practices. So worship, study, serving, giving, and sharing our faith. The words in Matthew and Mark's gospel that Jesus pronounces come from Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I'm so grateful that this prayer is recorded in Matthew and Mark because I don't know a single person who at some point in their lives doesn't feel like Jesus felt on the cross for much different reasons. But people I've been with who felt that God had forsaken them 
And when I read that Jesus, in fact, when people come to me and say, I feel like I must be a bad Christian because I feel I'm struggling with doubt and I wonder where God was in the middle of this. And I'm like, listen, this is what Jesus said when he hung on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you know what? Jesus is quoting David who says it in Psalm 22, verse 1. And so it tells us it's okay to feel forsaken of God. It's okay to communicate. But I want us to recognize Jesus is praying when he's on the cross. He's praying a prayer, what's called sometimes the prayer of dereliction, that feeling God was derelict in his duty. Where was God at the moment? Because that's what he's feeling in the midst of his pain. He knew with his mind God had not forsaken him. But with his heart, this is what he feels. But he prays nonetheless. So sometimes the most faith-filled pray, prayers that we pray are the ones where we feel we've been most abandoned by God. God is conspicuous by his absence. Where are you? And yet we're still praying. And we cry out and, and we think of these as lamentations or complaints. The Psalms are filled with them. An entire book of the Bible is a book called Lamentations in which the faithful people of God are crying out, where are you and why have you forsaken us? And, and when are you going to come to help? And here Jesus is praying, but he's praying. And I want you to notice he's praying and he's praying the scriptures. So we pray and we study the scriptures, and we find in this first prayer, Jesus is praying and he's studying the scriptures. Three times Jesus prays from the cross. Twice he quotes scripture from the cross. This is clearly indicative of the fact that these were practices that were important in his life. Jesus prayed constantly. Before he made important decisions, he prays. When, when he's approaching the last week of his life, he's praying. When he's healing people who are sick, he's praying. He is constantly in communion with God. So Jesus has practiced this. This is a part of the rhythm of his life. And when it comes to scripture, we see Jesus from the beginning of his ministry when he's facing the devil in the Mount of Temptations and he's quoting scripture back to, Jesus, uh, to the devil as a way of saying, I am not going to do what you're asking because this is what the scripture says. Throughout his life, even though he's not always quoting scripture, he's alluding to scripture. There are hundreds of times in the gospels where Jesus is alluding to a scripture here or there and he becomes the embodiment of scripture. When it comes to on the cross, uh, quoting scripture, we have these two, as I mentioned, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then we find this prayer that comes from Psalm 31, 5, into your hands I commit my spirit. I love that prayer. That's a really simple prayer you could memorize. It's one that you could pray every day. I pray that many times. Into your hands, oh God, I commit my spirit. Into your hands, I commit my life. Everything I am, I commit to you. It was William Barclay who said that Jewish mothers would teach their children this prayer from the time they were little children. And I love that image of Mary standing by the cross, watching her son die and hearing her son pray once more the prayer that she taught him when he was a little boy. Into your hands I commit my spirit. So, so we talk about worship and prayer, we talk about study and scripture, but we move from there to serving. And as I think about serving, you know, the entirety of the crucifixion was Jesus serving, right? So he says just before his death, he says, the son of man came not to be served, but to serve. And how would he serve? By giving his life as a ransom for many. You remember the disciples are arguing that just before Jesus' death, which one of us is the greatest? They don't realize that he's about to be crucified. Which one gets to sit on his right hand and on his left hand when he comes into his kingdom? And Jesus says, it's not that way with you. The kings of the, of the Gentiles, they lord it over other people. But for you, if you're going to really walk with me, it means you're going to serve each other. If we're going to walk with Jesus, then we're going to have to pray know the scriptures, and we're going to serve, which is what Jesus did as he's hanging on the cross. But I love this. There's a, there's a glimpse of how Jesus does this that's really, you know, we've talked about the five things that we do and how the ring finger represents the people closest to us. So on the cross, one of the seven last statements of Jesus is he looks down at his mother, and then he looks at his disciple, John, and he says, John, take care of her. The literal words are, behold your mother and behold your son. I love this. This small little act tells us that Jesus was not thinking of himself even as he was dying, but he was thinking about his mother and who's going to take care of her when I'm gone. And so we talk about giving and, and of course our giving is in response to God's giving. God's given us everything. Everything I have is because of God. The, the very air that I breathe, the fact that I'm still alive, the time that I have, whatever influence I have, whatever financial resources I have, because God somehow gave the capacity for me to be able to earn a living and do what I do. And so it all belongs to God, not, even, not just 10%. Everything is God's. And I think about, you know, the highest act of giving is to, is to lay down ourselves for God, right? Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their life for a friend. John 3.16, which everybody has memorized, God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. Right, he gave his only begotten son. Right, this is the nature of God is to give. And if we're going to walk with God, that has to be our nature. And this is what we see in Jesus. He's laying down his life. He's giving himself for us. 
So Jesus uh, speaks about this, you know, in talking about I came to, you know, seek and to save those who are lost, even from the cross. He's trying to do that in his self-giving. But the place where I hear that in the seven last words of Jesus or statements of Jesus is when he says, I thirst. Now, John says this, I thirst, and it just seems like a sort of commonplace thing to say, like, why is that included among the seven last words of Jesus? Except it's John. And everything John says that seems to be commonplace has some deeper meaning. So anytime you find some odd detail, it probably means something. So when Jesus says, I thirst in John's gospel, John intends for you to remember that earlier in the gospel, Jesus goes and meets a woman at a well, a Samaritan woman who'd been married and divorced five times and was now living with a man. And, and, she, and he says to her, give me a drink. And she says, are you a Jewish man, a rabbi, asking me a, a drink of water from this well? And, and he says this, woman, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask of me and I would give you living water and you'd never thirst again. And we're meant to see here that in this moment, the source of living water has run dry. He's poured himself completely out for us so that we might have living water. He's given everything he's got. He has given everything he's got. That leads to the fifth essential practice, which is uh, that of sharing our faith or witnessing to our faith or drawing other people back to Christ. And I'm reminded again, you know, this was Jesus' passion. This is what he lived for, his mission statement to seek and to save those who are lost. He wanted people to know that God is the God of the second chance. And so we come to the cross, and I love this. Jesus is still doing this to the end. So there are people who crucified him, and they're standing there watching. There are people, the scriptures say, who, who uh, beat him and, and, and humiliated him with a crown of thorns upon his brow, and they're standing there. And there are people walking by, and they're hurling insults at Jesus. All of this is happening. I can't even imagine what it feels like to be hanging there on the cross, experiencing not just the pain, physical pain, but the emotional pain of being made to feel small, people trying to make you feel like you're nothing. And that's what they were doing to Jesus as he hung there. But you remember his response in Luke's gospel. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What a powerful thing that Jesus prays. Well, you get finally to uh, what happens next, and that is the two thieves on the cross, the bandits, one on either side. Lestai is the Greek word. It means somebody who could be a violent criminal. And, and probably at least one, maybe both were revolutionaries who wanted to lead a revolt against the Romans and had murdered people undoubtedly. And, and the one man hurls insults at Jesus, right? He hears, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. That sounds weak, and he hurls insults at Jesus. Maybe if I make Jesus feel smaller, I feel a little better even hanging from the cross. And the other man says, why are you saying that? This man's done nothing wrong. And then you remember he turns to Jesus and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I love these words of Jesus, which, which capture so much his heart. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. From the cross, he's still trying to let his light shine. From the cross, he's still trying to draw non-religious and nominally religious people, broken people and sinners, to the Father. And if this is what he's trying to do, how much more so are we called to do the same thing? If we're going to walk with Jesus, this has to be a part of the rhythm of our lives, is drawing others to Christ. And that leads to the last thing that Jesus says on the cross. In Greek, it's just one word, tetelestai. In English, we translate it as three. It is finished. It is finished. I love how Bishop Will Milliman says, this is the kind of thing that uh, Michelangelo would have said when he looked up at the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel when it was done. It is finished. Like the masterpiece is finished. I used to read this like, it is finished. No, it was a shout. It's completed. It's done. Fine. And when Jesus says, it is finished, in essence, he's saying the same thing. What he came to do, he came to show us the depth of God's love. He came to show us our brokenness, the depth of God's love and mercy, and to draw us to the Father. And so when I think about that, I think about these last words of Jesus again, and how in them we see the beauty of God's mercy and grace, but we also see how Jesus practiced these practices. And if we're going to walk with him, we're going to do these kind of things. We hear it in, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And into your hands I commit my spirit, these prayers that he prayed from Scripture. Or behold your son and behold your mother as he served his mother and cared for his mother. Or father, forgive them for they don't know what they do as he was seeking to give love and life and grace away to those who were lost and broken. Or today you'll be with me in paradise as he was describing his love and mercy and drawing others to him. Those who were uh, non-religious and nominal, the thief on the cross. Today you'll be with me in paradise. I thirst as he gave everything he had, poured it out, and finally, that summary statement, it is finished. 
So in these, we see the five practices we've been talking about these last six weeks. We see that Jesus worshiped and he prayed. This was an essential part of his life. Prayer was an essential part of his life. Studying the scriptures and being able to recite the scriptures in the moment of his deepest pain because he'd had to memorize because this was a part of his life. The fact that he was intent upon serving others, and this is why he came to the cross, was to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. His generosity in giving his entire self for the human race. And finally, his desire, his deep desire to continue to witness and to share his faith, the faith that he had in his Father and his mercy and grace with a thief on the cross. All of those point us to these practices that Jesus lived that we're inviting you to live. And as we live these practices together, we grow into a deeper walk with Christ. We walk with him, we experience his love and grace, and we become the people he wanted us to be. So my hope and prayer is that together we might have a deeper walk with Christ as we practice the five essential practices. In Christ's name, 